On this Sunday night, a daring and traumatic rescue at the Syrian border. How Canada helped coordinate an international mission. Who are the Syrian civilians known as the White Helmets? And why did a rescue need to happen now? Also tonight, two provinces feeling the heat. Dozens of fires are burning out of control. A number of Canadian communities on high alert. This is The National. Tonight, the world is learning more about a dramatic rescue from Syria and Canada's crucial role in this international effort to save lives. Civil defense volunteers known as the White Helmets were in deadly jeopardy. Government forces were closing in on them and their families in the country's southwest corner. Last night, 422 people crossed into Israel with help from Israeli forces. They were loaded onto waiting buses and taken to refuge in Jordan, but many others weren't able to make that crossing, and tonight their fate is up in the air. The CBC's Murray Brewster was first to report on Canada's part in making it all happen, and he begins our coverage. It unfolded under the cover of darkness and an extraordinary cloak of international secrecy. The Israeli military shepherding hundreds of Syrian first responders and their families through the border and on to neighboring Jordan. A multinational mission to rescue the rescuers. The White Helmets forced to flee the onslaught of forces loyal to Syrian leader Bashar al-Assad. Throughout Syria's brutal civil war, the White Helmets have clawed through the ruins for survivors of airstrikes and shellings. They've borne witness to atrocities, and for that they say they have been marked for death by the regime. Sources tell CBC News a Canadian diplomat in the region red flagged their imminent danger, and it went all of the way to the top of the political chain as NATO leaders met earlier this month. Foreign Affairs Minister Christia Freeland made an impassioned plea to her counterparts, saying Western countries had a moral obligation to act. As the summit in Helsinki held the world's attention, rescue plans were coming together. But some white helmets were torn between leaving and staying. I think a lot of white helmets will stay till the end. They, they really have sacrificed too much. Know that it is them and them only who will be there to rescue the civilians that are invariably going to be trapped, uh, unsafe, and at the hands of a very cruel regime as it moves forward and taking territory back. At last count, 422 White Helmet volunteers and their families made it out. Two other groups did not. Roughly 800 are still trapped and moving within Syria. Their fate remains unknown. Murray, it's great to get that backstory on how the rescue came about. What else did Canada do to, to seal the deal? Well, Canada has promised to take in 50 of the White Helmet volunteers and their families. Now, that could amount to about 250 people. However, as we've noted in our report, there are fewer White Helmets that got out than expected, so that Canadian number could very well drop. One of the things that Canada has promised Jordan is that the White Helmets will not remain in Jordan for very long and that they will be processed quickly and brought to Canada and to Germany and to the United Kingdom. Now, Canadian officials have said that they're going to be setting up uh, screening, security screening, similar to what they did uh, for the 40,000 Syrian refugees that came through the system and were resettled in Canada. But let me quickly ask you about that, because you talk about how this processing is going to happen quickly. There's already been a, a backlash on social media, for example, some of it fairly ugly about, uh, you know, some are saying the, a security risk posed by the White Helmets coming to Canada. How effective uh, will these security checks be? Well, the security checks that went through last time uh, were very stringent, and the federal government insists they're going to be just as stringent this time. Much of the accusations directed against the White Helmets are the product of a Russian disinformation campaign. Um, they are labeled as terrorists by both the Assad regime and the Russian government for publicizing all of the atrocities that have taken place in Syria. All right, Murray, thank you. You're welcome. Today, Foreign Affairs Minister Freeland thanked Israel, Jordan, the U.S., and other countries as she tweeted out a tribute to Syria's civil defenders. 
The White Helmets are courageous volunteers and first responders who risk their lives to help their fellow Syrians, said Freeland. That volunteer aspect is part of what makes them seem heroic. They are everyday citizens who rose to the occasion as the escalating civil war laid waste to their communities. They claim to have saved 115,000 civilians, many pulled from rubble. And they've lost at least 260 of their own volunteers. Sometimes they were killed as a second airstrike happened as they were doing their rescue work. But as Murray mentioned, the White Helm has made powerful enemies by thwarting the al-Assad regime. Susan Ormiston takes a deeper look at how the rescuers became targets. <laughs> So many times, just like this. Not just first responders, the only ones. White helmets, volunteers rescuing thousands of civilians in the torturous Syrian war. Last week, as Syrian forces backed by Russia ran over rebel-held areas in the southwest, the white helmets were trapped. With no chance of safe passage out, here's why. Assad said publicly that like, these white helmets are his worst enemies. And he said publicly that they are spies of the West. So it was very, uh, very, very critical. And the White Helmets told governments in Canada and Germany and Britain, they said, look, if you don't help us now, we gonna die here, Assad will kill us. The Syrian regime accuses White Helmets of faking rescues, of making up chemical attacks. Syria and Russia label them foreign agents funded by Western governments. On the human rights situation in Syria. Parliamentary visits like this one to Ottawa feed into their narrative. Last year, when a short documentary on the White Helmets won an Oscar, the Russian embassy in London shot back, tweeting, indeed, they are actors serving an agenda. And when they were nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize in 2016... Well, what did they achieve in Syria? They have made some mistakes, say those who've helped train them. Just volunteers, thousands of them, who've struggled to stay neutral in the midst of such horror and record what they've seen. The reason these allegations exist is that because the White Helmets have done an incredible job documenting the crimes, particularly of, of the Syrian regime and Russia. And therefore, these two countries have put all the, what they've got in terms of propaganda and their propaganda machine to try and defame and, and discredit the White Helmets. Last week, as the war crept closer to Israel's border with Syria, Prime Minister Netanyahu was asked to help the White Helmets out. Today, he said the lives of the people who saved others are in danger. But his opponents accused him of trying to deflect criticism away from the escalating campaign against Gaza. They were called the bravest of brave tonight by the UK's foreign secretary, and Britain will take in some as well. But as they leave, many more are left inside, vulnerable. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, London. Here's what else we're working on tonight on The National. A former Trump advisor took to the airwaves today, vehemently denying FBI documents that allege he operated as a Russian agent. Toronto police facing pressure to deal with an increase in gun violence this summer, so they're putting more officers on the streets. CBC took a ride with officers to see what that means to some residents on the front lines. But first, an anxious night in some communities in Ontario and British Columbia under threat from forest fires. In BC's southern interior, dozens of fires are burning and firefighters are bracing for another week of potentially dangerous weather. Renee Filipponi is in the Okanagan where hundreds of properties remain on evacuation alert. The smoke coming off the Mount Aeneas fire started as a puff this morning, but grew throughout the day. And that's exactly what the crews wanted to happen. In fact, they set it ablaze. A piece of unburned fuel between two fires and uh, the objective was to remove that fuel in a controlled circumstance at our timing. For now things are improving. The concern going forward is the hot weather on the way. The hope is the wind won't come with it. When this burns completed if everything goes as planned we'll be in a much better position. That's where you had the big 80-foot flames. And, and you could feel the heat here. Yes, you could, yeah. The Fitzpatrick family vineyard was shut down for three days because of how close the flames got. It reopened today. Gordon Fitzpatrick says when the fire started, everything seemed fine, 
and then the wind changed. But then uh, it shifted and uh, moved to the south, and uh, that's when uh, Mount uh, Aeneas, which uh, normal, right there, which is right here, that's when that became a towering inferno. And uh, I would say at one point, you know, we were looking at flames that were, they must have been 80 feet high. A wedding booked here had to be moved. Fitzpatrick says in the end, the community really came together. The vineyards are uh, unscathed, and so uh, despite uh, what was some uh, harrowing uh, moments, uh, we're back open for business at Fitzwine. Nearly every year, communities in the Okanagan are put on alert. Peachland is bustling today, but it's taken a hit over the past few days. The mayor says tourists stay away, and she thinks more could be done to get ahead of the fires. Once this is all said and done and the debriefing has taken place and there's a report on it, perhaps we could look at the higher levels of government and say, you know, we need more resources, we need more money put into the, the helicopters or the planes, the water bombers and uh, the personnel. At this point, most of the evacuation orders have been downgraded to evacuation alerts. But the message for people living near the fires, keep your bags packed because that could change. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Peachland. And this is the situation tonight in B.C. More than 100 fires burning across the province. Across the country, a volatile situation is also unfolding in Ontario. There are more than 60 active fires. The largest is near French River Provincial Park. Philip Lee Shannock is there. Near the park's entrance, many vacationers who were ordered to leave gathered for the trek south. A massive wildfire burning for days has forced hundreds to evacuate this popular Ontario resort area. A steady stream of cars head south, following an evacuation order as fires grew bigger. It now covers 50 square kilometres, and as many as 30 fires are burning out of control. Even locals have never seen anything like it. We weren't even sure if we'd have a job to come to today. Yeah. Yeah. After last night, with all that smoke and that, because we didn't know how close it was to our homes or to work or... Yeah. Whatever. It, it's scary. And Thursday night, uh, we could see a glow all over the trees. We were all scared. We were always thinking, all thinking that we may have to evacuate or, or whatever, because Hartley Bay was evacuated last night. They even closed our workplace early yesterday. It's pretty scary. It's scary. Uh, we've never seen this, and we've never seen this. Firefighters have arrived from other provinces, B.C., Alberta, Saskatchewan, P.E.I., and Newfoundland. Also, crews have come from Minnesota and Wisconsin, and as far away as Mexico. That help will be needed. According to the province, this has been an extreme year. We surpassed the 10-year average uh, due to a high number of lightning fires. The mandatory evacuation order remains in place, and the Ontario Provincial Police have set up roadblocks to stop anyone from going into the evacuation zone. The weather has turned over the weekend, with rain and cooler temperatures helping a little and winds have shifted, blowing smoke from the fires away from cities and towns and over Georgian Bay. And much depends on the weather. Storms are forecast over the next few days, but that's a mixed blessing. Along with rain, there could be high winds and more lightning strikes. And that's what caused some of these fires in the first place. Philip Lee Shannock, CBC News, French River, Ontario. Yet another ex-Trump staffer is feeling the heat tonight. Former campaign insider Carter Page is again denying any Russian connection in the face of new evidence made public this weekend. The CBC's Paul Hunter has that story. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Rare are the moments like last week when reasons for Americans to wonder what's up with Donald Trump and Russia are on such specific display. In fact, for all the allegations, questions and denials on whether the Trump campaign colluded with Russia to undermine the 2016 U.S. election, it can be sometimes hard keeping up with who's said to have done what and when in the weeks and months before and after election night. Which brings us to Carter Page. No, I've, ne I've never been an agent of the foreign pol uh, power in any, by any stretch of the imagination. Emphatic today that, no, he's not a spy and never was. Once briefly an advisor to the Trump campaign with prior ties to Russia, but he did not, he says, help the Russians get Trump elected. This is so ridiculous, it's just beyond words. But in U.S. federal court documents made public last night, it's clear the FBI believed and had evidence 
that Page was, as the documents put it, an agent of a foreign power and was the subject of targeted recruitment by the Russian government. The documents are formerly top secret applications by the FBI seeking judicial permission to wiretap Page. They first came to light months ago when Republicans and Democrats fought over whether they signaled the FBI was abusing its power. Tweeted Trump today now that parts of the documents are public, witch hunt, rigged, scam. But the documents show the wiretap was approved by Republican judges four times before and after Trump won the White House. Much of the more than 400 pages are redacted, and Page has not been charged with any crime. Today, emphasizing he may have had conversations with Russia at different times, but... I'm very careful in terms of, you know, making sure that there's a clear record. Uh, there is nothing in terms of any nefarious behavior. Okay. Meanwhile, the Russia investigation moves ever forward. But to the questions, when will it all wrap up? How are all the dots connected? What exactly is it that's going on here to date, Ian? There are answers to none of it. And in your story, Paul, you mentioned the Helsinki summit. Any word yet on what Trump and Putin talked about in that private one-on-one? -on -one? Short answer, nope. Um, word from both Democrats and Republicans today is that here we are almost a week later and no, uh, you know, whatever was talked about between those two remains between those two, raising questions from Democrats today again about what is behind all the weirdness with Trump. Uh, lawmakers and commentators alike are more and more suggesting aloud that the only explanation anyone can now imagine is that Putin really does have something on Trump. It's what many have long wondered but dismissed but are now putting it out there. It's like for all the trees these past many months, people are now finally seeing the forest because they have no other explanation for his behavior. There's still no proof, but it's all they got. And Trump is doing nothing to dissuade anyone. Ian. Okay, Paul, thank you. Here are some of the other developing stories that we're tracking tonight. An explosion near the Kabul International Airport killed 14 people today, narrowly missing Afghanistan's controversial first vice president. The former Uzbek warlord was returning home after living in exile in Turkey for more than a year. A local affiliate of ISIS claimed responsibility for the attack that wounded more than 50 others. About 200 people attended a memorial service today in Branson for the 17 people killed last week when a duck boat sank in a Missouri lake. Nine of the dead were from the same family. The church bell chimed 17 times in honor of each of the victims. Their boat sank Thursday during a sudden storm. Reports say none of them were wearing life jackets when found. He needs a good one. Well, he has hit it. Tiger Woods had one of his strongest showings in years at a major, his best since 2013. He even held the lead briefly during the final round of the British Open today before fading. Woods finished tied for sixth place at five under par, three strokes behind the Italian Francesco Molinari. It is the first time a golfer from Italy has ever won a major golf tournament. And the Hamilton Tiger Cats have traded former NFL player Johnny Football. Johnny Manziel, part of a five-player swap with the Montreal Alouettes. He never actually took to the field during a regular season game with Hamilton. He is trying to rehabilitate his career after being cut by the Cleveland Browns in 2016. Still to come on The National, we'll take you on a ride with the Toronto Police Service as they work to address mounting gun violence in the city. And you'll hear from a Newfoundland runner who keeps beating running records in her 80s. And in an effort to get people out of their cars, find out what London, England is doing to diversify the cycling demographic in the city. We have got to make sure it's not just those white men in lycra of a certain age cycling. And that gives the wrong image as well with cycle superheroes as well. It's all about fast powering rather than pottering along on your bicycle with a basket at the front, the sort of more traditional view you might have.
A series of deadly shootings in Toronto this year has many people on edge demanding authorities do something to reduce the violence. But there is a lot of disagreement about what that something should be. The city has pledged to add night patrols in some of the riskiest neighbourhoods. The CBC's Marie Michelle Lauzon went out with police last night to see how residents are reacting. It's almost 7 p.m. at Toronto's 23 Division. Officers are getting ready for their Saturday night shift in Rexdale, an area in the city's northwest that's known for gang violence. For the next two months, 200 additional officers will be on the streets, part of a new gun violence reduction plan designed to address the recent spike in shootings. First stop tonight, this park, where five years ago, 44 people were arrested and money, drugs and weapons were seized. Tonight, the police have another mission. Our purpose here is to uh, engage with the community in a positive way, develop relationships so they feel comfortable speaking to us when something is happening in their community. The police presence is welcomed by these residents who say they live in fear of the violence in their community. Some gun is there, some the drug is there, and is there, uh, but the communities don't like it. Are you afraid? Of course, if you have there, it's afraid. Everybody's scared. The police, the people, is helpful in the community, and now it's very polite. Their second stop, a few blocks away. This residential area might seem calm tonight, but a number of shootings have happened here. This is one of our high-priority neighborhoods. That's why we're out here trying to uh, speak to residents, get to know our residents, make them feel safe, try to assist them in whatever way we possibly can. The final stop of the night, a family party in the backyard. The owner, Ultris Otley, is more than happy to see police officers. A few months ago, her neighbor, a 22-year-old man, was shot dead in front of her house. It's sad to know we had to live in so much fear that if we hear firecrackers, oh my God, everybody fly inside because we think it's a gunshot. It's sad to know your children can walk free because we live in fear so much. Well, now they change the light so we feel a little more secure. And now and then we'll see the police coming around. But we want the police more in the community. This night is just one snapshot, but it shows some residents here appreciate the increased police presence and shift in focus. Mary Michelle Ozon for CBC News, Toronto. Next on the National, Calgary may be known as Canada's oil and gas hub. It turns out it has one of the longest cycling path networks in North America as well. But does that mean more people are getting on their bikes? Plus, Mexican fishermen call it the devil fish. It's also known as the sucker mouth catfish. Neither one sounds very appetizing, but two California entrepreneurs are trying to give the fish a rebrand. This idea of trash fish, I'm not fond of that name. <laughs> Nobody wants to eat a trash fish. We need to be more open to trying new things if we want to support a healthy food system. Oh, it's super cool. It's friggin' super cool. It's okay to date the crazy guys. A surge in the number of cyclist deaths in Toronto has brought bike safety front of mind for many people across Canada. While cities ponder the best way to expand cycling routes safely, the tension between riders and drivers continues to be an issue. The CBC's Aaron Collins brings us this look from Calgary. On a sunny summer day, Calgary's new cycle track is rolling. Cutting right through downtown, it's part of the largest urban pathway and bikeway network in North America. Well, Tom Babin knows this track well, a new path that the author and local bike blogger says has thousands more people cycling in the heart of Canada's oil and gas capital. You get what you build for. So if you make it safe for cyclists, people will ride their bikes. If you, all you do is build for cars, people are only going to take their cars. Now the key to the track's success, making cycling safer in the inner city. The vast majority of people want to ride a bike more often, especially for transportation, but they don't feel safe. Right. And so the intention of on-street separate bike infrastructure is to make it safe. Not only make it safe, but also offer the perception of safety. That seems to be working. Bike collisions are down in the three years since the cycle track went in. Still, not everyone is a fan. 
For some, all those bikes have been bad for business. George Condon's menswear store is right along the new cycle track. He says the track replaced parking spots and cost him business. Since the program uh, has, has been in now, which is exactly three years, I would probably say it's had an effect of about 25% of my sales. One of Condon's biggest complaints, the paths and his store are pretty much empty in the winter. I think the city of Calgary is, is definitely more of a driving vehicle city. Back on his bike, Tom Babin says that could be changing. Um, the number of cyclists in winter, yeah, it's smaller, but it's also growing uh, proportionately. So as the total number of people on bikes grows, the number of people riding in winter grows. A big shift, but an important one, according to Babin. He says that as more cyclists use bike paths, collisions for bikes and cars go down, making Canada's roads safer for everyone. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. Across the Atlantic, London has seen a 154% rise in riders since the year 2000, but there's concern that interest has peaked, so officials are trying to bring more diversity into the mix by getting more women to cycle. Here's the CBC's Margaret Evans. <laughs> Sometimes they look like they're floating through traffic, carried along by the current serene. Other times, it's more like they're swimming with sharks, ducking and diving their way through a world where the humble cyclist can get swallowed up by traffic or crowds or both in the blink of an eye. Cycling in London can be hard graft. Those who dare are part of a select club, accounting for just 2% of journeys made, most of them by men. Enter the mammal, the nickname earned by middle-aged men in Lycra who seem to be channeling the Tour de France. Yeah, they're annoying. <laughs> they're really annoying. They're just aggressive to everyone. I try to ignore them. Susan Lun <laughs> has been cycling to work um, for four years. It is aggressive. I'm not an aggressive cyclist, but I think a lot of women feel that it is quite confrontational. Mammals have even been singled out by city planners as a bit of a problem as London tries to reimagine itself as a cycling city of the future. Carolyn Pigeon heads the Transport Committee for the London Assembly. We have got to make sure it's not just those white men in lycra of a certain age cycling. And that gives the wrong image as well with cycle superheroes as well. It's all about fast powering rather than pottering along on your bicycle with a basket at the front, the sort of more traditional view you might have. Last year, just 27% of London's cycling journeys were made by women and only 15% by ethnic minorities. City planners say there must be more diversity in the cycling lanes if the trend of people swapping cars for bikes is to grow. Brilliant. OK, good morning, everybody. It's a really exciting day today. Trainers from Cycle Confident getting a class ready to go out on the road, a cycle over to Hyde Park. So we're always cycling with our fingers over both of our brakes, using our gears. Let's go. The Bike Skills Company works for a number of different boroughs across so, London. So we're going to turn around here. Offering cycling courses for all levels. London is under pressure to reduce the carbon footprint and congestion and create more sustainable city environments. Marketing director Brian Beausoleil admits he himself fits the mammal mold, but he says courses like these are about helping all kinds of cyclists feel just as comfortable on the road. They want to see people who would not normally ride on a road to get on the road to do their errand or take the children to school or to shop or to commute. Dina, you're at the back because you're the strongest. You're not at the back because you're in uh, the dog box. <laughs> Most who sign up are women. Maria cycled as a girl back in Portugal and wanted to brush up. She's now been coming for years. Candy is a beginner who wants to commute to work. I wish, you know, um, there are ways and means sometimes of getting to places just on a bike. But sometimes it's impossible or scary. The mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, has pledged to double the number of cyclists on the roads within a decade. At pro-cycling rallies like this one, he's preaching to the converted, and the city has made great strides over the past decade. 
There are now six cycle superhighways designed to carry bike commuters into the center of London and across it quickly. And five more potentially in the works. But not everyone is on board, especially taxi drivers like Neil Johnson. Cycle lanes have been a massive, massive disaster for most of London. Johnson insists the routes are underutilized and creating gridlock. He calls the diversity argument a red herring. They realize they're not as popular as everyone makes out. So they're now trying to find excuses for the reason why no one's using them. But more than one million cyclists have used the two flagship cycling highways since February. And for many, that's a success. As for diversity, cycling advocacy groups say there's really only one sure way to get more people on their bikes, and that's to make the roads safer. Fran Graham works for the London Cycling Campaign. There's a lot of stuff that can be done, a lot of programmes that do work to get more diverse people into cycling. But if you train someone and then they go out and they don't have anywhere safe to cycle, they're not going to continue to cycle. In other words, if you build it, they will come. Just ask Candy back at her cycling class. I want to cycle on my own. I will get there. You watch this yeah. race. <laughs> I'm going to do it. I've got a bicycle now. <laughs> Let's go. A few more road warriors ready to go, albeit maybe a little kinder and gentler. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Now here's a preview of a story you can watch here on The National this week. Nick Purden meets Saskatoon's most unlikely pot merchant. I went into shock, like, straight up. I just was completely... Whew. I just really thought I was dreaming. Like, I actually pinched my arm, like, really hard, because I'm like, there's no way. <laughs> You might react like that too if you got one of the licenses to sell recreational pot in your hometown. I mean, 1,500 people applied for licenses across Saskatchewan. And Sierra Sleben Chewback was one of only seven who met the criteria to set up shop in Saskatoon this fall. So at 23, Sierra is a trailblazer. Telling people that are asking me, what am I going to do with my life when I'm done school? And I say, I think I'm going to open up a marijuana dispensary. Like, a lot of people just sort of look down on me for even saying that and just sort of rolled their eyes, because to them, they're like, this girl literally has no chance. Like, you go for it, kid, but there's no way. We are live here on The National. Earlier in the hour, we were telling you about the number of shootings in Toronto this year and the increased police patrols at night. And sure enough, there's breaking news this hour. Local media reports of multiple, multiple people shot in the Danforth. That's a neighbourhood just northeast of the downtown core. Toronto Transit says that the subway not stopping at the uh, station closest to that area, Chester, we know there is a large police presence, that paramedics are on the scene. An eyewitness says the shooting happened earlier this hour. Another witness telling CBC News that they heard more than 20 gunshots and that police told them there are between six to eight victims. We haven't confirmed that information. Still very early, the police service confirming there's been a shooting, but they're not providing details on the circumstances, the number of victims or their condition. We will stay on this story through the evening. Here are some of the other stories we're following this week uh, on The National. The Assembly of First Nations will be holding their annual general meeting in Vancouver. And on Wednesday, they'll be voting for a national chief. Five candidates are in the running, including the incumbent, Perry Bellegarde. The AFN is facing a flurry of legislative activity from Ottawa, including a bill to recognize Indigenous rights. You worried at all about going to jail? U.S. politics will intensify on Wednesday when the trial of Paul Manafort begins. President Trump's former campaign manager facing charges of money laundering and tax fraud. He is the first defendant from the Mueller probe to go on trial. The charges stem from Manafort's work as an advisor to the Russian-backed government in Ukraine. But prosecutors allege it continued through the Trump campaign. Can you see her? 
And a U.S. federal judge expects to see the last of seams like this by Thursday. That's the deadline that he's imposed on the Trump administration to reunite all migrant families separated at the border. It isn't clear how many reunions have taken place, but it has been estimated that 2,500 children were eligible. The separations and detentions of children were met with a storm of criticism, and the president was forced to order a halt to the practice. Adventuresome travelers have long been attracted to the French islands of saint pierre Miquelon, just off Newfoundland and Labrador. But until this summer, ferries heading to and from the territory could only carry walk-on passengers. That was all set to change until the road to France hit a dead end in Newfoundland. Chris O'Neill Yates explains. Gisèle Laverne Brent and her husband John are visiting from Saskatchewan, taking the ferry from the French territory Saint Pierre Miquelon back to Fortune, Newfoundland, where they had to leave their car. The car would have been nice. I think it would have added to the trip to see the area, um, see more of the island than what we did, I think it would definitely have added a nice touch. Two new $25 million ferries built by the French government were supposed to transport cars, containers and recreational vehicles. But they've been sailing with empty car decks since they were launched almost two months ago. The problem is that the dock upgrade needed for cars to drive on and off the ferry on the Newfoundland side hasn't even been built yet because the Port Authority in Fortune can't come up with the money. That's a big problem, says Stéphane Lenormand, president of the territorial government of Saint-Pierre-Miquelon. As of 2015, when we began building these ferries, we approached the Port Authority in Fortune to prepare for their arrival. But unfortunately, in October of 2017, the project stalled because of a lack of financing. Saint-Pierre Miquelon and Fortune are connected by 200 years of history, separated by 40 kilometers of ocean. These new ferries were built to replace the old one that could only carry walk-on passengers. For the first time in history, people were to be able to take their cars. A big boon to tourism and to commerce between Newfoundland and its French neighbor. Fortune Mayor Charles Penwell says there have been plenty of discussions, but no solutions. It's been ongoing too long. The ferry is running. Work needs to be started. If, if we started work tomorrow, it would still be, you know, next season, really, before we can, can handle traffic. Le Caplon. Boutique owner Cathy Simone welcomes the two new ferries and the business she hopes they'll eventually bring. For Canadians, she says, it would be interesting to come with their cars because even though the islands look small on the map, there is a lot to see. For now, all that is on hold, but Le Normand doesn't put the blame on the Port Authority. It's a volunteer organization handling a large economic development file, he says. That's part of the problem. The file is very complex, and this is a big sum of money for them. So as the tourist season kicks into high gear, these ferries come and go every day without the cars they were built to carry, with no help from Ottawa or the province in sight. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Saint-Pierre Miquelon. You may soon have a healthy but unusual snack option. Two young American entrepreneurs are trying to turn an invasive plague into a tasty environmental solution, but because of a U.S. trade dispute, their hopes may depend on Canadian appetites. Kim Brunhuber has a story from Berkeley, California. Mind if I try a little there? No, please. Please do. This jerky is, to the uninitiated, an acquired taste. Think a piece of leather that's been left to soak in a bait bucket. Are you guys happy with the flavor? Uh, yeah, well, we're, we're going to refine the recipe, I think, a little bit more. The recipe for their El Diablito jerky, say 30-year-old Mike Mitchell and 29-year-old Sam Bordia, is a work in progress. But the fishy taste is intentional. These chewy brown strips began life in a Mexican river as one of these, Hypostomus plecostomus, or sucker mouth catfish. But Mexican fishermen have given the lizard-like fish another name. The Pez Diablo, the devil fish. Um, I had no idea what it was at the time. If you own an aquarium, you may know it as a type of pleco, which you can buy to keep your aquarium clean because it eats algae. And it's very, very good at it. It arrived in Mexico probably about 
15 years ago and it's taken over the waterways. And today it accounts for about 70 up to potentially 80% of the wild fish capture in a lot of these regions. It's highly aggressive and it reproduces like crazy. So it's really like an evolutionary miracle. This miracle isn't much to look at, all spines and scales, and it turns a cadaverous gray when you cook it. Few outside of its native Brazil are willing to eat it. In fact, many even wrongly believe it's poisonous, so it's usually considered a trash fish. A lot of the properties that make it a hard fish to cook, as you would, say, a normal white fleshed uh, fish, um, actually lend itself very well to making jerky. So the two master students started a company called Akari Fish and built a small processing plant in Mexico. Soon, local fishermen, instead of throwing out the hard-shelled, bottom-feeding pez diablo they caught by accident, would catch them on purpose and sell them to Akari. We've seen a huge boost in incomes. Uh, on average, they're earning 25% more than they were previously. Now they're hoping to scale up the fish jerky operation by using an American production facility. How do you go about marketing a creature if we don't really <laughs> eat? Yeah, it's a good question. This is a great opportunity where, like, by eating our fish, it's not only that you're not harming the environment, you're helping the environment. So we see a really positive story that we can tell. Next up, there are fish balls and burgers in the works. They were hoping to have their first bags of jerky in the U.S. stores by mid-August, but Bordia says... There's a catch. But, um, we just somehow found ourselves in the middle of this trade dispute between Vietnam and uh, Mississippi. A law protecting American catfish farmers from cheaper Asian imports means there's effectively a ban on foreign catfish, including theirs. So Mitchell and Bordier are now thinking of launching El Diablito in Canada. Just this last week, we have started looking into what we need to do to comply with Canadian regulations, and then we can start um, shipping it around Canada, which is a really exciting opportunity for us. So, will this actually work? This idea of trash fish, I'm not fond of that name. <laughs> Nobody wants to eat a trash fish. But the general concept and idea of eating these underutilized species is a good one. And, and we need to be more open to trying new things if we want to support a healthy food system. And the lionfish... Kim yeah, Thompson, who manages the Seafood for the Future program at the Aquarium of the Pacific, Pacific, says there is a precedent for rebranding trash fish. For years, Thompson says, sustainability-minded companies have been trying to sell Americans on the invasive lionfish with mixed success. So in terms of the broader market and having an international export market, it's a little bit tougher to say at this point whether or not that would be economically viable or make sense. And Thompson says there's no hope of getting rid of an invasive species just by gobbling it up. The problem with some, a species like lionfish or a species like the devilfish is that they're pretty prolific. So realistically, you're not going to eradicate them, but can you keep them under control? And there's a lot of research that suggests that Perhaps you can with the right um, tools and management. Now, days after graduation, the two head towards a bank near the Berkeley campus. So this is your first check? This is our first check. <laughs> we are very excited to deposit this. A $2,500 check from a social venture competition in Milan. Is, they uh, say it's just the beginning if they can create enough appetite in Canada for the strips of fish inside. Or, at the very least, the origin story printed on the bag. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Berkeley, California. Next on The National, an 80-year-old from Newfoundland and Labrador smashes the record in a grueling 10-mile road race. Her story is our moment of the day. You know, quite a few people um, had to drop out as well, you know, but at least I made it and finished, and that was what I wanted to do. And a reminder, you can get the real story from CBC News journalists all day long. Find powerful images on Instagram, exclusive video on Facebook, and you can tweet us anytime at CBC The National.
What are you doing? Nothing. Florence Barron crossed the finish line of the Telly 10 full of smiles today. Despite the humid Newfoundland weather, she ran the 10-mile race in just 96 minutes. So that sets a new record in the over 80 age category. The previous mark was 2 hours and 23 minutes. Did you do the math? She beat it by more than 45 minutes, and her record-breaking run is our moment of the day. That was my aim to, um, to break that record. I knew I could easily do it. I did it uh, close to 50 minutes faster than the last record for an 80 year old. So um, that, that I was really happy about that. I started when I was 59. So this is the 21st uh, time of running this 10 mile race. And people keep saying I inspire them and I just love it. I enjoy it. And I want to prove to people that you can be this age and you can be fit. So. I, I say if I can motivate them, that's perfect. That's what I want to do. So our producer Sarah was speaking to her, and I believe she said that she was the only over 80 in the category this time around. But on the other hand, she's 80 years old, and she's running a 10-mile race, and she's setting records, and she's looking forward to being there next year. And uh, there are a couple of ways to look at it. You know, it's inspiring, I guess, and she hopes it is, in fact, inspiring for people that they should be, could be fit uh, well into their 80s. On the other hand, it means I have a few more years before I have to start running. That is The National for July 22nd. Good night.